Hello, hello, and welcome back to another installment of Trey the Explainer. And boy, do I have a good one for you guys today. It's 2018, and it's that time of year again in which I make a video recapping some of the most interesting paleontological discoveries made in the last year of 2017. But before we start, I'd like to take note of, and some of you hopefully have, my new microphone. I've since moved on from recording audio off my, and I am serious, crappy iPhone 4 internal microphone, and I'm now working with what professionals used. Now you can enjoy my sexy voice at hopefully some of the best quality I can bring you. Additionally, I'd like to thank all you guys for my end-of-the-year 2017 present. We finally done it, guys. Just before New Year's, I was able to reach 200,000 subscribers. Again, thank you so much. You're the best fans anyone could ask for, and I really mean that. And for a third and final time, I'd just like to thank you for all you do for me. As always, sorry for the long wait for this video. In addition to life getting in the way, let's just say I've been distracted among other things. Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang gang, I say the Gucci gang, Gucci gang, Gucci gang gang, I say the Gucci gang gang, I say the Gucci gang gang, I say the Gucci gang 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 gang. Well, anyways, we had quite a year with many cool and fascinating discoveries to get to. And so without further ado, let's start my 2017 paleontological recap. Alright, let's start off this list with certainly one of the loudest discoveries made in the year, and one which basically divided the entire paleontological community. I am, of course, talking about the 2017 Bell Paper, published concerning a well-preserved Tyrannosaur specimen nicknamed Wyrex which had been hidden from the public eye basically since its discovery. For many years, rumors about the specimen and significance circulated. I even referenced it all the way back in 2016 in my original T-Rex feathers video. I even begged the paleontologist studying it to publish the research already. Little did I know my pleas would be answered in only a year. And when the discovery came out, I think my response was a little lacking and a little rush. So I'm going to briefly discuss the discovery now that the riffraff has died down. Basically, the discovery was that the Wyrex specimen possessed sporadic impressions of scales across several regions of the body. The impressions themselves are tiny, the largest being around 30 centimeters square, with other impressions declining in size from there, often being only a few centimeters across. The scale locations included the back of the neck, pelvic region, and the tail. The individual scales themselves are incredibly tiny, and in life, T. rex's skin regions probably would have looked almost leathery or smooth on account of them being so small. Think less iguana-like with giant individual scales, and more like this mutant, scaleless lizard. The authors of the paper interpreted the discovery as evidence that Tyrannosaurus rex and other closely related Tyrannosaurs likely largely lost or did not possess the fluffy filaments of their more basal Asian relatives such as Eutyrannus and Delong, which were likely covered almost head to toe in poof. I think my original video on the subject kind of overly downplayed the discovery as I claimed it didn't really change much. I have to say I have to somewhat alter my position because although the impressions are small and a few are in locations we already knew to be featherless, in actuality I must admit the fact that their distribution supports the position that Tyrannosaurus rex was probably majority scaly or featherless in its adult life at least. This, however, does not mean Tyrannosaurus rex or other Tyrannosaurus were entirely featherless in all growth stages of their lives. The Bell Paper admits this, and even suggests that the large Tyrannosaurus, such as T. rex, might have possessed a feather or filament mohawk, or spine, which entirely disagrees with the sensationalized headlines perpetuated by the media. Furthermore, I unfortunately didn't bring up the interesting possibility brought up by the authors in the paper, and this is that these scales are actually feathers in disguise. As the paper notes, the scaly feet of modern birds, although once thought to be a holdover from reptilian dinosaur scales, are actually now considered to be feathers that re-evolved or secondarily evolved into scales. The authors suggest that this might have been the case with these T-Rex scales. They are secondarily evolved from feathers. And as paleontologist Mark Witten notes from this, everyone wins, the scaly versus feather debate under this interpretation. This suggestion opens up a myriad of possibilities. You see, reptilian scaly skin is not like that of birds. Reptilian skin is static. Once the scales form in reptilian skin, they are stuck like that forever, and they cannot turn into feathers or filaments. Bird-like skin, however, is much more dynamic, as Witten puts it, and allows for tons of variation based on the animal's life stages and seasons, changing from feathers or filaments to scales, and vice versa. This could mean that T-Rexes were born with feathers or filaments, but subsequently lost them in adulthood, or a Tyrannosaur could have changed its appearance in response to the climate. I know this is a bit confusing, and it is, but I think the largest thing I need to note is that most media outlets, myself included, oversimplified the situation in its discovery a bit. 
The integument or skin coverings of dinosaurs is a very complex subject and it's not as easy as black or white. In this circumstance, it's not as easy as saying a dinosaur is either feathered or scaly. Both could be right to some extent. In summary, the bell paper basically states that adult Tyrannosaurus rexes were probably largely feathered or filamentless in life, and their skin would have possessed a largely leathery or smooth texture. This does not necessarily disprove the animal was entirely featherless in all stages of its life. This was not the complete fabled death of the feathered T-Rex, nor a return to Jurassic Park Rex, as most claimed, but a view into the complexities of paleontology in reconstructing these weird animals. We have much to learn and much research before we can say anything definitely. What's cool is that I found out after I published my original video, some of the authors of the paper are fans of my video, so hi guys if you're watching. I combined the next two discoveries as they basically concern the same topic, dinosaur coloration. In the past years, paleontologists have used extremely well-preserved dinosaur specimens, which preserved microscopic coloring determining pigments, called melanosomes, to determine, well, what else, the color of these dinosaurs in life giving us probably the best look at what these animals would have looked like in the flesh. For example, scientists were able to determine that the feathers of Microraptor were iridescent like that of a crow or raven, and that the bellies of a giant Eocene penguin were maroon, and that the small Ceratopsid Ceratocosaurus possessed an almost deer-like countershading. Well, this year two dinosaurs were given a detailed coloration. The tiny little compie by the name of Cynoceropteryx has been proven to have possessed a rust or chestnut with white colors, as well as a banded raccoon or lemur-like tail ever since 2010. But a study made in 2017 took this entire raccoon resemblance a step further by revealing that Cyno also possessed a bandit mask over its eyes. This extremely well-preserved ankylosaur, Boreopelta, with its heavy armor and scales, helped illustrate that the animal had a reddish-brown color with countershading similar to that of Cetacosaurus, which was used as camouflage. This camo helps us understand that Boreopelta, even with all its armor, was under threat of predation. I always find these type of discoveries as very interesting as they help us understand dinosaurs and other extinct animals as well. Animals, just like ones we have today. Not monsters or mythical creatures, but things just as normal as the deer, bulls, raccoons, coyotes, wolves, and squirrels of now. And, speaking of monsters and mythical creatures, basically one of the things that was discovered last year. The Triassic was one of the weirdest periods in history. Just after the Permian mass extinction, much of the order in the ecosystems across the globe had been disturbed. Clear niches and roles for specific organisms were not as well defined, and as a result, many strange evolutionary experiments emerged from this confusion. In Triassic India, for instance, Shringosaurus was a large four-legged reptile, with its most striking feature being two horns that protruded from its forehead. These horns resemble those of later ceratopsids, but evolved entirely independently from them. Although the exact nature of the horns is not known, odds are they were sexually dimorphic or appeared only in males, and were probably used for display or combat. One of the last discoveries of the year was a new and unique little theropod. We know that birds evolved from less birdy theropod dinosaurs, and there is a gradual incline of transitional fossils illustrating this. But we must remember, evolution isn't a ladder, it's a tree with no goal or idea where it's progressing towards, and oftentimes there are more evolutionary dead ends and branches that break off and become something else than an actual linear progression. For the same reason apes still exist even though humans evolved from them, so do other organisms break off and become their own separate thing. Hazkelraptor is a great example of this. As birds were evolving, there were a myriad of proto-birds, or dinosaurs you could say halfway or two-thirds the way or seven-tenths the way of becoming birds. And the thing is, only a few lineages actually became birds. Many broke off and, like a moody teen, became their own thing. One of the cousin's two birds that were not quite birds, but were fine with remaining so, were the dromaeosaurs, or their more common name, the raptors. Some became great walking falcons, the lions or wolves of their day, and others took on a different approach. Haskell raptor was one of these unique guys. Instead of subduing prey with giant claws and chasing them down, Haskell raptor preferred well, likely fishing. About the size of a mallard duck, this dinosaur had a lengthy snake-like neck, which took up 50% of its total body length. Haskell additionally possessed a very slender build in areas such as the head and legs, reminiscent of later swans. This comparison is no mistake, as many other characteristics, such as flattened wing bones of this protobird, paint it as semi-aquatic, like penguins and other water birds of our day. Such a discovery makes this animal the second semi-aquatic non-avian dinosaur as of yet discovered, in addition to Spinosaurus. Such discoveries paint the picture of how little we know about animals in our prehistory, and how diverse the Earth once was, with many unique evolutionary one-offs now almost entirely lost to us.
Who knows, what else is out there? A predatory hadrosaur, large, lost mammal lineages coexisting with the dinosaurs, buck-toothed dinosaur- oh wait. What is hidden in our past has always fascinated me, and I stand in awe of the sheer amount of possibilities that might have happened and are still waiting for us to discover. If you ever feel down, just remember we have discovered the jaws of a giant predatory polychaete worm and named it after a death metal band bass player. The jaws of Webster Oprion dwarfs those of previous fossil worms, and paleontologists have calculated its size to be 1 to 2 meters in length. It was closely related to modern bobbit worms. Bobbit worms today are terrifying predators with crazy jaws and fast reflexes. This giant Devonian counterpart would have been even more terrifying, launching out of its burrow to snatch a primitive shark or placoderm as a meal, just as its relatives do today. If you ever want to picture what an alien might look like, just look up polychaete worms with their multiple eyes, snake-like bodies, and a wide range of niches and roles. Just before the end of the year, a treasure trove of pterosaur eggs with embryos still inside them were discovered. This was one of the few times we've actually gotten to see the remnants of baby pterosaurs. A neat little transitional fossil was also discovered in 2017. Mollusks, that is cephalopods, snails, clams, chitons, ammonites, etc., have a very strange and controversial evolutionary history that I hope I might cover sometime in the future. Paleontologists have always wondered what the common ancestors to these animals was. Sure, we have plenty of candidates from the Cambrian period, but nothing for certain. A newly discovered slug-like creature might help us figure out what the first mollusks were probably like. Cavia pliosa from the Audivician was a truly alien-looking creature covered in short spines and having a fingernail-like shell on its head. But one thing about this guy is crucial to malacologists, or people who study mollusks. Huh, you learn something new every day. Well, anywho, I'm talking about a radula. The radula, a serrated mouth-like structure, is one of the most important traits in all of mollusks and is basically serves as a teeth and jaw to them. The presence of a radula in this incredibly primitive organism positively identifies this guy as a mollusk, a primitive one at that. This isn't much of a surprise as Cavia pliosa largely resembles some of the most primitive mollusks alive today, the chitons. There's one main difference between Cavia pliosa and the chitons of today, their shells. Paleontologists have noted that as time went on, mollusks like chitons evolved an ever-increasing number of shell plates. Modern species have eight, older chitons have seven, the, and the oldest and most primitive mollusks like Cavipliosa only have one. It is likely that the ancestor of all mollusks resembled this helmet slug-like creature and similar relatives. There was another cool discovery of a baby bird trapped in amber 99 million years old. This guy came out from the same formation as the dinosaur tail feathers and primitive chameleons and geckos from 2016. It always amazes me to think that such detail has survived so long. There was also a new species of ankylosaur found that was named after a demon in Ghostbusters called Zool. They even invited Dan Aykroyd to see the fossil. Oh my god. The last discovery I put on this list of 2017 is probably the biggest and possibly craziest paleontology things in recent times because it could have such massive implications. Now we all heard about dinosaurs, weird, poofy, and scaly reptiles that dominated the earth for pretty much half of all uh, multicellular life's existence on this planet and still dominate just above our heads and we don't even know it. Yeah, you might have heard about them. Well, and up until recently, the most commonly accepted family tree of dinosaurs looked like this. Sauropods and theropods, or lizard hip dinosaurs on one side, and bird hip dinosaurs like ankylosaurs, hadrosaurs, and ceratopsids on this side. Well, a paper published last year messed this entire thing up by suggesting the tree should look like this. Sauropods off on their own, and theropods and Orniscian dinosaurs closer related, creating a new group called Ornithischocolo. Their evidence was at least 18 unique characteristics shared by Orniscians and theropods, which shows a common origin between the two. This new model might help us make sense of the presence of filament-like structures in Orniscians and theropods, and not whatsoever as far as we know in sauropods. This newer model certainly would change everything we knew about dinosaurs previously, because this previous model has been used basically since the 1980s. This new theory of dinosaur origins has been met with much criticism by paleontologists, and it's doubtful and probably too early to say if it will get any traction. I myself am not sure if I should jump on board with the revolutionary new theory just yet. I think time and future discoveries will tell which model is correct. All I'm saying is I wouldn't throw out my dinosaur textbooks just yet, who knows. And yeah, that's about it. I'm probably missing some things, but these are pretty much all the big discoveries of 2017. It was alright, I guess. Not too many neat discoveries in my opinion compared to previous years. It was okay, though. My predictions for 2017 were pretty vague, but I got one right about new colorations for extinct animals, so yes, 
My predictions for 2018 are a tusk or saber-toothed dinosaur of some kind, a filter-feeding Mesozoic reptile, some new origins of snakes, you know, that's been a little weird lately, and what the heck, just for fun, a prehistoric animal that might have been somewhat intelligent. Those are my predictions, and it seems 2018 has already shaped up to be an interesting year. Already, paleontologists have discovered the remains of a feathered dinosaur with rainbow coloration. So yeah. My actual plans for this year are varied, and I might want to talk about some human history and human origins along with paleontology, biology, and evolution stuff, and cryptozoology stuff on top of it. Here's a loose schedule for this year. It's probably not in order, and I'm probably only going to get to like half or less than these things. Hope you enjoy. See you guys, and um, good luck for 2018. Thanks for watching.